Let me go ahead and admit everybody from the waiting room, get everybody in here. Excellent. All right, great. We have a bunch of people today on the Zoom. I love it. Welcome, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us on this River Reflections on this wonderful, very hot Monday morning. Um, I'm glad to see everybody. Just as a reminder, uh, make sure that you have your um, both your mic turned off and also your uh, video turned off. It makes it a lot easier for the program to kind of do what it needs to do. Um, so to introduce myself, my name is Emily Green. I work with the Colorado River Alliance as the Mobile River Program Manager. Um, the Colorado River Alliance is an organization which champions the long-term vitality of the Colorado River through education and engagement. So super excited to see everybody here today. Um, if you have any sort of questions, comments, concerns, anything good, feel free to leave it in the comments and we will have a time at the end um, of our session with Kindle about, um, we'll do a question and answer towards the end. So um, real quick, uh, we also have Carrie Pearson on the call with us. Carrie, um, if you just wanna give yourself a quick introduction. <laughs> Hey everyone, I'm Carrie Pearson. I'm the Director of Development at Colorado River Alliance, um, and I have the pleasure of planning our gala, and we'll be honoring Kendall and Laura this year. So later on, after we hear all about Kendall's adventures on the river, I'll give you all some information on the event and the, and the uh, award and all of that good stuff. All right. Awesome. Thank you, Carrie. Appreciate it. We will see more from you later. <laughs> all right. We are gonna go ahead and get started with our guest of honor, Kendall Bennett. Um, so just a quick introduction, quick bio about Kendall. <clears throat> Kendall is a 30 year veteran of the real estate industry, having worked in development, construction, and as a principal in a billion dollar real estate investment fund. His extensive experience in structuring, syndicating, developing, and managing complex real estate projects throughout the state of Texas. Um, he received an MBA with a real estate concentration from the Keenan Flagler Business School at the University of North Carolina and a BA from the University of Texas at Austin. Um, he's actively involved in the Austin community having served on the boards of Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Texas, the Colorado River Alliance, that's us, all right, um, and as a member of the Board of Trustees of the Trinity Episcopal School. Um, Kendall and his wife Laura have two children, Barkley and Johnny. So quick introduction, but Kendall, I'm gonna let you also introduce yourself. Sure, thank you, uh, Emily, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, one of the uh, organizations I noticed with some people on this call that I'm currently on the board of is the Great Springs Project. So quick quick plug for Great Springs. Uh, those of you who aren't aware, Great Springs is an organization that is uh, actively involved in building a trail system from Austin to San Antonio uh, that connects the four springs uh, in the uh, in that area and so it's uh you'll hear more about that over the next year to two in the Austin community we're just kind of getting started uh, we've got a great uh, great core group of people and we're real excited about bringing that to the state of Texas um, but anyway thank you for the introduction I uh have been a Austin resident for not all of my life but most of my life I've lived here since 1985 with the exception of five years that my wife and I spent in North Carolina where I went to graduate school and worked for a little bit um, I uh, love the Colorado River. It's uh, to me, it's what makes Austin Austin. I've spent a lot of time, um, even before <clears throat> training for this race, um, on the river, both uh, on boats on Lake Austin, Lake Travis, uh, running around Ladybird Lake. Um, and I just feel like that if it wasn't, just imagine the city of Austin without the Colorado River running through it. It just would not be the same. Um, so. Very passionate about the, the river and and, um, and just being on the water. Um, I um, to kind of give a little history on this this crazy adventure that that uh, that I just recently embarked on. Uh, a good friend of mine, JT Van Zandt, who, as I was thinking about this this morning, I met JT for the first time at the Colorado River Alliance Gala. Um, kind of connect back to the alliance. Um, he, uh, uh, he is a fishing guide out of Rockport, Texas. And over the, and I met him probably at the gala. It might've been, I don't know, five to seven years ago. And, um, 
we became friends and I've fished a number of times and, and, and over the years he has done this, uh, this uh, the, the uh, Texas water safari I think four or five times and so I was always intrigued by it and and um, decided you know some, something that I that someday in my life I want to do and, and like like anything in life it's it takes a tremendous amount of time whether it's having children or something like this there's never a perfect time and so I, as I was thinking about it I'm not getting any younger and so I, I made the decision uh, to, to attempt it this year with a high school friend with uh, known for a long time with a high school and college kid guy named Warren K. Warren and I were lunch one day we're trying to decide you know something that uh, he wanted to do something kind of big this year and, and so I had just seen JT and kind of the, the Texas water spark came to mind so uh, neither one of us had spent very, we'd spent very little time in, in canoes so it was all completely new to us both. Um, and so, uh, but we decided we were gonna try it. And that was back in November of last year. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, the Texas Water Safari is a 260 mile canoe race that starts in San Marcos, starts at the headwaters of the San Marcos River. Um, they're at Aquarina Springs. Um, and if you haven't been on the San Marcos River, you should do it, um, especially as we're getting into these 100 degree days. It's, it's a beautiful body of water, uh, crystal clear, um, just incredibly, uh, it's, it's a great resource that quite frankly, I had not spent much time on uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in all the years I've spent in Austin. I feel like I missed a big opportunity to do that. But anyway, it starts in San Marcos. Um, and you, you basically, uh, you, in, our, in our case, canoes, there's a number of different boats uh, options you can use. Uh, we raced in the novice division, which in novice, you have to race an aluminum canoe, number one. Number two, you have to use a single blade paddle. You can use a double blade paddle. Um, and, and the third is neither of the contestants that race in the, in the novice division can have, have, neither one of us could have, could, could have done the race previously. So that, that, was, that was the three kind of requirements. But anyway, you canoe the San Marcos River, the San Marcos ties into the Guadalupe, and then you take the Guadalupe uh, through um, Cuero, through Victoria, and eventually down to Sea Drift into, into the San Antonio Bay or Tributary San Antonio Bay. Um, it, uh, you have 100 hours to complete the event. Um, we, uh, our first goal was to finish. You know, we, neither one of us had ever done anything uh, that, that long or, or difficult. Um, but as we started training in November, and, and we spent a lot of time training on Ladybird Lake, um, we would go out once a week and put in, uh, I'm sure most of y'all have, have seen the kind of the, the, the ramp right there at Austin High, we put in there early in the morning, and we would canoe up to Longhorn Dam, um, turn around, and then canoe back up around Redwood Isle, and then back to the dam. It took us about two and a half hours. And, um, we started doing that in December, and that was kind of the one, you know, a big part of our of our training. Um, we would do that once a week. Um, I was in the gym a couple times a week. I would run twice a week, and then on the weekends we would try to get down and do a section of the race. Um, and there, there's really ten different sections, um, and we did a lot of them multiple times. The sections between. Um, the start and about the third third way through are very technical. There's a lot of rapids, and and again, having not spent much time in an aluminum canoe, um, we had to learn how to steer the boat and how to navigate the water, and, and uh, that in itself was a huge learning experience. And a um, lot of great stories. A lot of uh, you know, at one point in our, in our third training run, um, we actually hit a rock, and the boat tipped very quickly, tipped over filled with water, ended up at the bottom of the river. And uh, we were about uh, probably five miles from the takeout and didn't think we were gonna get the boat off the bottom of the river. And it took us a while, it took us almost an hour to finally figure out how to get it up off, off the bottom of the river. And so we had a lot of stories like that, just being new to the sport and trying to figure it out. And, and uh, we saw in, our, in, in the train, the training was some of the most fun. You know, we, again, we did, so there's 10 sections. I think we did all but two of them two of the sections around Victoria are pretty flat and, and there's not a lot to them. And we tried to spend our time on doing the more technical, more difficult things. Uh, but we saw tons of wildlife uh, along in the training. We did a night run where we, we started at 7 p.m. during a race that ended at 10 and decided to kind of keep going. So we, we canoed that entire night uh, through just since we knew part of the, the Texas water spar was gonna be at night. 
and wanted to have some training uh, during the night. So that was really interesting to kind of be out uh, in the middle of the river uh, and not have anybody else out there. We're kind of in the middle of nowhere um, with, with headlamps and, and a, a little light on the bow of a boat. Um, and also, we also spent quite a bit of time, I think, I guess, uh, not say probably, but we spent some time down at the finish. Um, the, the last two seconds of the race are, are considered the most difficult. Um, the second to last section, you have to, uh, there's a number of log jams uh, where, where trees have, uh, over time get pushed up uh, and, and kind of create these log jams. You have to actually get out of, the, get out of your boat, quarters the boat around the log jams, and then uh, and they get back in. And so um, we, uh, we did that section and then we actually did the bay. The, the bay, it's you canoe about you know, across the bay. It's about a six mile crossing. Um, during our training run, uh, we had um, you know, 15 to 17 mile uh, winds. Um, you know, there's a skirt on the canoe, but there's water coming over the bow of the boat. Um, very, very difficult. We, we, were, we, we would average when we weren't in the bay, we'd average a little over five miles an hour. During that training on the bay, I think we were we were we were moving at less than two, and so it was, it was very difficult. And as, as we were sitting here thinking about this, you know, that was we were fresh that morning, and, and we were thinking, "Well, we're going to do this at the end of a 260 mile race, uh, and where we're we going to find the energy." And we got lucky in that during the actual race itself, the bay was flat, um, and uh, yeah, so it, we didn't have that challenge, thankfully. Um, but we, um, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but, I, but we, we started on Saturday morning at 9 a.m. Um, uh, we had uh, two team captains, my wife, Laura, who I think is on this call, and uh, a gentleman named Rob Smith, um, who uh, has helped me well, from a personal training standpoint for seven or eight years. For our team captains, and then my son Johnny, although he wasn't an official team captain, um, he was he helped out tremendously. And they, the team captain's role is they would bring us uh, food, water, and ice at nine predefined checkpoints along the race. Um, and they could not bring you anything else if you needed any, any repairs for your boat, or you know, if your communications device went out, if, you know, you were on your own. You know, the, the only thing they could legally bring here is, is food, water, and ice. And so they would meet us along the way. Um, it's always it was just fantastic to see them. You're out there by yourself. And you'd be surprised at the start. You see a lot of boats. But as, as the race goes on, you see fewer and fewer people. because Everybody gets more and more spread out. So it's always great to see our team captains and, and uh, kind of get re-energized re and get some, some food and, and some, some water and et cetera. And, and so uh, that, they played a very important part in it. But we, we started on Saturday at 9 a.m. and uh, canoed through the first night. Um, uh, the first night was, um, we had done that second, it was the same section of practice at night. So it was calm. It was, I think we had done it before, it was familiar. Um, and that went really well. Um, the second day, this was right after the first set, I don't get a lot of rain this spring, it was right after the first set of big rains. Um, the, um, the second day was, if you were, if everybody remembers, we had this kind of big, uh, uh, big heat wave, with tremendous humidity that kind of happened right about that time during the race. And so, um, the second day was very hot and humid and, um, but we had done a lot of this section or most of it anyway in the race. And then the third, the second night. Um, we were planning to uh, each sleep some the second night, uh, and, and we got, uh, as we were kind of moving through the water, which is going around the Guadalupe, um, the river was, was very, because of the rain we had had the last few weeks, the river was actually moving much quicker than we expected. And so, uh, although we had planned to sleep, we, we, we kind of made a decision on the spot that we really needed to stay awake. Uh, we're both, we were going to kind of switch off. Um, we both need to stay awake just to be able to navigate the water and, and, and thank what we did and, and we got through that and then, and then, um, uh, then, then Monday morning uh, as the sun came up it was, it was uh, um, uh, again very hot. Now, I remember looking at my watch it was 10 o'clock in the morning thinking God it's already hot and I've got you know, this whole day in front of me. Um, but kind of kept pushing through and it's amazing um, what your 
body and mind can accomplish um, when you, you know, set a goal and, and when you're focused. And we, we had trained very hard and we were, I think, both physically um, prepared and physically uh, ready. Um, you never know until you're in it, but uh, I think in hindsight we were. Um, we, um, and then as we, as we, we were getting, we got to the log jams, which as I mentioned earlier, is the second, was second to last section. And all of a sudden, you know, it had been hot and dry, this huge storm, kind of coastal storm comes in and you can kind of smell it and you kind of feel it. And the wind got to be blowing. It was at one point blowing, I, I'm going to guess, 20 to 25 miles an hour to the point where like we, we were in a pretty narrow section of the river and we made the decision, <clears throat> excuse me, to stay in the center of the river. We felt like that was the safest place to be. We were worried if we, the banks were really steep in this section. And we were worried if we got too close to the bank, we could be blown into a tree and break an arm or something uh, crazy like that. And so we just kind of just kept, kept the boat in the middle of the river as best we could and just kept paddling it through the storm. And luckily the storm didn't last long. And uh, shortly after the storm, we got to the last checkpoint. It was great to see uh, Laura and Johnny Masson and, 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 uh, and other team captain. And, and, uh, and then finished, uh, like, as I said, we got very lucky. And then by the time we got to the bay, that storm had blown out. And the, the bay was glass palm. And uh, we crossed and finished on Monday uh, at about 9.30 p.m. A little bit later. Um, hardest, my most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, but but also the most rewarding, um, just the, the training, the bonding that I had with my my, my partner, the time spent outdoors and on the river. Uh, it was just uh, just absolutely uh, amazing. Anyway, I've talked a lot. Um, I'll, I'll shut up, Emily, and, and you probably had an agenda or, or some questions or some more 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 of a structure of the program. But uh, I'll turn it back over to you. No, no, that's excellent. I love to hear about that. I'm just listening to you talk about it. My arms are tired just like thinking about paddling for that much. And it sounds like you endured pretty much every weather that uh, could be thrown at you. <laughs> right. But that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I've heard really great things about the Texas Water Safari before and how difficult it is. And so it's awesome that you were able to, you know, do that with your friend and have your family involved and be able to do all of that. So I really yeah. appreciate you sharing sharing your adventure. It's a really amazing group of people that, you know, there's a lot of people that say you're either one and done or you're in it for life. And a lot of the people that are really in this, in the Texas water spark community are just fantastic people. And, and because we were novice, uh, we had a lot of people help us. I can't tell you how many times people would either offer suggest suggestions to us on the water or so, you know, how to keep the boat straight or how to navigate rapids or even you know, a lot of strategy on diet and what you eat. So we had a lot of people, four or five in, in particular, that, that were just always helpful, you know, willing to do anything they could to help us. I've heard that uh, when you're not a novice, when you go back, if, if, you, if you decide to go back and, and do it again, that people aren't nearly as helpful because you want your competitor. <laughs> Uh, but, but at least for this past year, uh, we had a lot of help and, and really got really enjoyed meeting a lot of people that, that, that are in the Texas Water Park community. Yeah. And obviously, they love the river and they're passionate about uh, you know the outdoors. And, and so I, I had to share this common connection with them. Definitely. And do you think that you're going to do it again next year? I've been asked that question a number of times, and I'm, I'm not ready to make that decision. <laughs> uh, it would, let the it, blisters it, on your hands heal a little bit more. It would, yeah, yeah. It would be a, a joint decision between uh, me and, and my wife. And it, uh, it takes a lot of time. The training itself takes a tremendous amount of time. And so, uh, uh, but I, I did thoroughly enjoy it. So, but it would never be, it'll never be the same. You know, being, being, having run novice, uh, you know, having just the unknowns, now, now that a lot of it is known, it, it just, it would be different. But I don't know, I haven't decided yet. <laughs> Yeah, we still have, we got time. <laughs> Especially, that's so impressive too. You mentioned finishing in novice and y'all finished second, which is extremely impressive. For We did. We but did. We were, again, our, our first goal was to uh, was to finish. And then as we got into it and, and as we got later in our training, we, we realized, wow, you know, we were actually, we, there, there were a number of preliminary races that lead up to the safari that we ran in. And so you kind of get a sense of who the competition is. And we ended up winning a bunch of those preliminary races. And we thought, wow, maybe, maybe there's a chance we can you know, 
be up on the podium. Uh, in novice and, and uh, fortunately, yeah, we, we finished second. And we were in the lead for a while. We had we actually had a boat leak. We had we uh, in the first day, we um, you know you're kind of bumping around hitting rocks and, and these aluminum canoes that are, are older. They're, they're that, that we that the, the canoe that everybody wants is called an aluminum craft. And we don't make them anymore. And so the aluminum crafts that you find are typically made in the 70s and the 80s. And so they they they've seen their share of races and they're pretty feet up. And so um, anyway, long story short, um, we kind of rubbed against the rock at some point during the first day and it caused a small pinhole leak in the bottom. And so we were taking on water to, to, to the tune of, you know, we had to bail the boat probably once an hour, um, which in addition to just the, the energy required to bail the boat, just the extra weight of the water um you know just it's just more weight to push through the river and, and i think we my partner one i both wonder if, if we wouldn't have gotten the hole in the boat you know could we have won you know we'll never know the guys that, that beat us beat us by uh, an hour and a half or maybe a little bit more and you know, they were 15 years younger than us and so you know my guess is they probably still would have beat us but but, but um, anyway we're very happy to finish in second yeah definitely that's crazy that on the first day there was a leak that's a no. yeah <laughs> Yeah, there were 146 participants and 99 people finished. Wow. And, and, and they say that because the heat played a big part in that this year, um, in that uh, the, the, the heat, and, and he, it wasn't just the fact that it was hot and humid, but, but it was also the fact that we hadn't had a lot of really significant heat. In fact, if y'all think about it, we've had a we had a pretty, the race was in June, in early June, and we had a really mild spring. And so we really, none of us, none of the contestants really had much practice um, uh, in the heat and humidity. And so when, when it did happen during the race, I think it really took, it really took the toll on a lot of people. Yeah, that makes sense. And were the contestants all from Texas or was it international or national? Because I feel like they probably wouldn't have that heat experience either. If they... Yeah, we met people, you know, even the race day from, from uh, Wyoming, we met a guy from Canada. I mean, yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, there's people from, from all. Over. I mean, obviously, clearly, a lot of people were from Texas, um, but yeah, there's people from all from all over. Wow. Yeah, especially the poor Canadians. I'm sure were uh, not not ready for that heat. Right. right. <laughs> but, wow, that's looking cool that everybody joins in on that. I've heard it's. Um, I know it's billed as the world's toughest canoe race, so I guess it lives up to the name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I, I can relate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, I just, uh, I know that, of course, you are expending a ton of calories every single day by doing that, but what kind of food did you eat? Like, what was your favorite food to have whenever you were racing to, you know, get your energy back? So our, our staple, our primary staple were peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And I, I think um, Laura counted, I think she had something like 21 uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Throughout the race, needless to say, I haven't had one since. Um, but it's you know it's 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 easy um, to transport. It's 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 energy. It's got good protein. Um, 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 we also had kind of an energy drink um, that we would, uh, we would every time we'd stop, we would, we would have some of this energy drink. Um, and you know we there were a few things. We had some ramen. Um, we had some bars. Um, but believe it or not, I mean I. I uh, we would have two peanut butter, two in our food bags. So we, we'd get to these checkpoints, and we would basically take the food bags that we we you know, we had just used, and throw those on the shore and grab fresh food bags from our team captains. And it's, it's kind of like NASCAR; you're trying to kind of get through these checkpoints as quickly as you can. Um, and um, and so you know, you, you, it was always a surprise. They were really good. You know, like one at one point we had some peppermints. That you, can't imagine how excited you are to get a peppermint after you <laughs> water for three days. Um, but uh, but but peanut butter and jelly sandwich. If I, if I had to say what was the staple, um, that was that was our staple. You can't go wrong with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Honestly, I right. get it. <laughs> well, um, I'm you know whenever you were talking about doing the race and everything, of course, it was you and your friend had been talking and you had decided hey, this could be something that we're really interested in. You know, we started training, doing all this kind of stuff, but what would you say throughout that entire process? What do you think was the most rewarding 
part of doing this entire experience? The entire experience, I think, I mean, other than the race itself, there was, not, there was nothing with the, the feeling of coming across the bay and getting to the finish line and you know, seeing my family and, and you know, that obviously was you know, you know, the, the, the most probably rewarding thing of it all just because it was a culmination of months of training and, 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 and just hours of, of prep and, and, and work. But, um, you know, I think, I think just being, it, it really gave me just an incredible appreciation um, for, for the river and for Texas and, um, you know, just being, you know, starting, if you think about starting at the headwaters of a river and then ending where, it, where the same water ends up in the Gulf um, is, is pretty cool, you know, and, and just really appreciating the fact that, that uh, um, you know, the, the, the river itself is used for, you know, for drinking water, for transportation, for, for entertainment and enjoyment, uh, recreation. Um, um, it, it, I think I, I, I gleaned a, a, a big appreciation, not that I, you know, I've, I've always loved rivers, but it just kind of deepened that appreciation and that uh, uh, attractiveness of, of the water. Absolutely, yeah, you get the firsthand experience of really seeing that journey that the water takes through its entire process, which right. is really cool. Absolutely. Um, whenever you were on the river, did you see, of course, you've had many experiences with rivers and been involved and loved them for a long time, but did you see anything like surprising or new or learn anything totally different? Not really. You know, one of the things that, that I didn't mention is, is we had to portage, I think, seven different dams. And, um, you know, other than, you know, you having spent so much time in Austin, you know, I see, you see the dams, you see Longhorn Dam, you see Tom Miller Dam, but you don't really realize, at least I didn't really realize how important of a role the dams play in maintaining water levels until you have to actually, you know, portage around them multiple times. And it just, it showed, it, it really, it really, uh, it was interesting to me. And then I really learned about how different sections of the same river, you take the same Marcus, um, look completely different because of the dam process, or the, because of the dam stuff. Um, and actually, I just remembered that we have pictures that we can share, and I have a picture of y'all going over the dam, trying to navigate that as well. <laughs> that was our first portage. That was uh, in Staples. Um, and you can, and that was actually our first checkpoint. So you can see we're, we're, we're getting out, we're swapping our water bottles, we're swapping our food bags. Rob Smith, uh, our uh, one of our team captains, kind of right there in the center uh, between the morning and I. Um, and uh, yeah, so we had to, that was one of our porters. That was, that was uh, uh, that staple thing. And the section, for, for those of you who have not been on the same market, the section between the headwaters. Um, or really, you can't really, other than race day, you can't you can't canoe a boat up to Aquaman Springs. It's not allowed. They they allow the Texas Water Spar to use it, but but I guess the earliest, the quickest you can put in is right there in, in, in right there by Texas State, right there in, in the middle of town. But from that section to this dam, uh, it's just gorgeous. Um, gotcha. Um, I went to Texas State, so I definitely understand where you're coming from and where you're talking about. Um, which kind of brings me to the question, did you have to, on the journey, did you have to interfere with, you know, people who were tubing and- We did, we did. <laughs> In fact, right after the section, um, uh, you go through a number of, and remember, it's, it's super hot and it's Saturday. And so, um, you know, we had seen some people who were training, um, but, but it hadn't, A, it hadn't been as hot and, 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 and B, we, we were kind of training at, at odd hours. But yeah, there was a, a lot of people on the river that day that we had to kind of <laughs> navigate around. I but looking, that, looking at that picture, uh, you know, you can tell, I mean, you know, the, that uh, the, the boat, uh, 3006, as, as we called her, um, you can kind of see the dents and dings. And, you know, that this is a boat that, that we, uh, we rented for the season. Um, uh, but it, this was not its first safari. It's, uh, it's <laughs> these old aluminum crafts are, are, are really hard to find. But they're perfect for this race. Yeah, it definitely has, um, it adds character. It has character. Uh, <laughs> Let's see, I know we have another another picture here. Um, 
which I was going to have you talk about if I can open it up and it's a picture of your hands and I was wondering if you could talk about just the physical aspect of you know everything that you were going through you know one of the things that everybody told us uh when we were training um and you can see real quick about talking about hands, you can see that the eye sock in the of my neck um so one of the things that our team cats would bring us is they would, they would bring they would fill those socks and they were they were, they were like owls sewn together with little velcro components and they'd fill those with ice and it's just a fantastic feeling you're out in the heat and just throw that ice around your neck and cool off and kind of soothe your, your muscles but but one of the things to your question about hands that everyone told us when we were training was do everything you can to keep your hands dry um don't wear gloves because gloves are going to stay wet or, or will we'll get wet both because of the river and with sweat and if you, the, the, the drier you can keep your hands the better shape they'll be in through the race um <clears throat> and you can imagine over the training we didn't that we had done you know, we had built up some calluses and and uh, in our hands but once our boat um sprung the leak it was it made it very difficult to keep our hands dry we were constantly dealing with the water in the boat um, and having to bail the water out of the boat and so because of that i think if, if, if uh, someone asked me earlier um you know how long it take your hands to recover it probably took about a month and just the, the blisters um uh that, that developed and, and uh, that was in the last day um you know the thing that i think about the most is is just kind of pushing through that pain in my hands and those blisters you had literally had blisters that had popped on top of blisters that had popped um but just kind of you know pushing through it and, and keep getting the tennis. yeah definitely i like blisters on top of blisters like could only imagine especially just the repetitive movement of everything right. definitely let's see i'm gonna go ahead and see if we have other pictures i'm just to you know give a quick sure of everything. We got some action shots here. Okay, so that was right below, um, that was kind of towards the start. That's right, it's right below, you, you, since you went to Texas State, you probably know where those falls are right there close to campus. Yes. Um, this was interesting. We were planning to, there's a couple ways to run. There's, there's three falls kind of right in a row, and that's the second of the three, I believe, maybe the first. Um, we had run those falls multiple times in practice and, and and we were told by a number of people look don't don't you can lose your race on the first day it's a long race don't try to be you know crazy and and do something that's going to take you out of the race and so we had planned to portage these three falls we'd, we'd run the, we had run the falls a number of times sometimes it was successful sometimes it wasn't um and so we kind of decided you know the week before look let's just portage let's portage and let's safe and we know we're, we're not going to we're not going to tip and have to, you know, get out and and drain the boat and etc um but one of the guys um a guy named gaston jones who was kind of one of the guys that and gaston's done this race a number of times i think he's i think he's done it 19 times and he's won he's won multiple divisions where well, he, he was doing it this year not racing novice but doing it in an aluminum boat with his uh 17 year old daughter who by the way who had, this was her third safari at 17. Wow. um and they ended up winning the aluminum division um, but anyway gaston happened to be at the starting line happened to be right in front of us and and uh, and, and and we watched as we watched him uh we watched him basically navigate that first fall right in front of us. And I, and I looked back at Warren and he goes, let's do it. And so we followed him. And so we kind of made a, a game day decision. They're like literally right there at the last minute and ended up following his line and, and making it through all three falls without portaging. So it, it saved us a ton, tremendous amount of time. And it was, it was a great morale boost for us just because we, we didn't have, there was a huge line for the porters who was taking us forever to do that. So anyway, it was, it was, that, was a, that was, that was a fun moment in the race. Yeah, definitely. I can only imagine, especially since it was towards the start and everyone's closer together. I'm sure that was a right long line. <laughs> Excellent. <clears throat> I know I've been, Carrie sent me over a bunch of pictures and I've been looking and I was like, man, maybe I want to do this river safari. Just yeah, like, you should. You know, that. here's the thing. There's a lot of people that do it. You know, we, we were, 
Warren and I are both pretty type A competitive people. And, you know, kind of once we kind of started winning some of the preliminary races, we said, man, let's, you know, let's at least try. Let's, 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 let's see if we can at least, you know, podium. But there are so many people that do it and, you know, stop and sleep. And, you know, there's, there's, you can attack the race a different bunch of different ways. You know, you have to finish in 100 hours. Um, you know, we finished in 61 hours and 45 minutes. Um, but there were people coming in, you know, again, we finished Monday night. The award ceremony is Tuesday at noon. So we, we you know, went back and went showered and uh, got some sleep had some breakfast, came back to the award ceremony, and there were boats coming in. So we were sitting in the middle of the wars, and all of a sudden, somebody would go, hey, boat coming in. So we'd all go to the water and cheer them all in. Um, that was Tuesday morning, and there were still boats coming in Wednesday morning. And, you know, again, again you know, people just, they wanted to see the river. They, they, they weren't really interested in competing, and they'd stop and sleep and take their time. And so there's different ways you can, you can approach it. It doesn't have to it doesn't mean, it, I'm not going to say it's easy. It's still difficult. You're still, you're still canoeing that same 264 miles. Um, but you don't have to do it all without stop. Yeah, definitely. You can take the more scenic route if you would like and really get to experience the river and everything. Right. For sure. Definitely. That's awesome. Well, I appreciate, you know, you talking about your whole adventure and everything, but if you could share one message about the river and your experience, what would it be? Um, to me, it's, it's, preservation and this is one of the reasons why I'm such a big fan of the alliance you know I, I was on the board of the alliance for a number of years I chaired the board I'm on the advisory board advisory council um, it's such a precious resource whether it's the Colorado or the San Marcos or where I live um, it's just a big part of, of, uh, of our state and um, you know I would just encourage everybody to so one, get out and, and enjoy these wonderful resources we have here, you know, in, in Central Texas. But also, you know, remember how important they are and remember how important conservation and, and uh, preservation is, not just for us, but for, you know, kids and grandkids. And, uh, and hopefully, you know, at some point, my great, great grandkids can still, you know, do the same things and compete in the safari and still a beautiful stretch of water. And, and uh, uh, it, it is, it's just a, it's a, really special resource. Yeah, absolutely. I agree 100% having that generational conservation and all that work really, you know, pays off in the long run. Absolutely. And of course, you know, with your firsthand experience, I'm sure it just renewed your love of the river. You've been oh. involved with all these groups and, you know, of course you've served on our board <clears throat> previously and um, you're going to be, uh, you and Laura are going to be honored as our um, uh, River Heroes this year. So of course that's very exciting too. And so it's it's awesome to see y'all getting out there and really getting in touch directly with the river as well. It's very cool. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm actually gonna pass it over to Carrie. Um, she is gonna give us a little bit more background on the John Lay River Hero Award and the gala and all that good stuff. But thank you so much, Kendall. I really appreciate you taking time today and talking to us about uh, the Texas water safari in the race and appreciate it. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. Kendall, that was an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. I had no idea. Laura sent me a bunch of those pictures and I got to see the entire race. We only picked a couple to share here. So maybe we'll follow up with um, an email and send out a bunch more pictures. I mean, it, it was quite an impressive feat and I'm sure we are all um, just wishing we had that determination, um, had your determination. So yeah, congratulations. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, if you guys don't know, we are honoring Kendall and Laura this year at our upcoming Cocktails with Colorado Gala, um, which will be held on October 21st at the Hotel Van Zant. And we'll be honoring them as the John Lane River Hero Award recipients. Um, if y'all don't know about the gala, it's our largest and most important fundraiser of the year. And um, we'll host about 400 of Austin's leaders and key influencers. Um, and they are all passionate about our greatest natural resource, the Texas Colorado River, just like Kendall, which is why we are honoring him. Um, it's a night of celebration and all of the funds raised will go to help the Colorado Ridge, um, River Alliance's mission and our programs. 
Um, if y'all are interested in sponsorships, we have a couple left. So y'all can email me and I will put that here in the chat um, in a minute. Um, so about the award, each year we um, select a community member to receive the award um, for their dedication and commitment to protecting the Texas Colorado River. Um, and we present that award at the gala. Um, past honorees include the family of former president Lyndon B. Johnson, Ray Benson, I have sleep at the wheel, uh, Ray Wilkerson, which is whom our Red Bud Center is named after, um, community leader Gary Farmer, Pam Akins, who is on our host committee, um, past mayor Will Wynn, and past governor Rick Perry. So just a really long list of amazing people. We're so glad to add Kendall and Laura to that list finally. So y'all have been amazing supporters over the year. Um, Kendall's been on our board, like Emily has mentioned. Um, he was our board president for many years. Um, Laura and Kendall, actually they were our gala chairs, I think back in 2017. And um, Laura has helped me over the past three years, you know, learning about the gala and fundraising and who our community is. And I just, I just love the Bennett. So I'm personally, um, very excited to work with them on this event and be able to honor them. Um, and Kendall, even though you're not on our board, you and Laura still support our mission. We won't let you go. So no. we appreciate all of your help. Um, Y'all are tributary league members and you help with strategic planning. Um, so we really, really appreciate you and we thank you for sharing your story and all of your amazing support over the years. Um, I'm not sure if Laura or if Emily asked you, but when you were on the board, um, what was your biggest accomplishment? Can you tell us all what your biggest accomplishment was? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, I was not here at the time, but, but when I was on the board was uh, during that time frame, uh, we rolled out the Mobile River. And I remember at the time, uh, Sarah Richards, who was our ED, brought in kind of this cardboard model of this bus and present to the board and we're like what what is that and she had this idea um you know i think we ought to, she said it's great we have this red bud program that um kids can come out and um come to the facility but what about the kids that can't what about the kids that you know for whatever reason they don't have the budget to come to red bud um there's a lot of kids that really need to you know have they need to learn about this resource and so it kind of started there and, and you know, we kind of created this whole business plan and, and uh, yeah, hopefully most of you have seen the, the mobile river now. And so it can remind me of how many schools it, it goes to, but it, it hits a lot of schools in central Texas. I know there's been thoughts and again, I'm not on the board anymore, but another thoughts about doing another one and, and maybe kind of continue to expand its reach, but it's just, it's a great vehicle because it, you know, I'm a big believer in education and, and, it allows our younger generation to be educated on the value of, uh, of, of this wonderful resource. So that was my far my, my greatest, my, it, it, my, the, 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 most, the thing I was, I guess, the most proud of being uh, involved with. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Emily is our Red Bud Program Port uh, Manager now. So if y'all don't know that, um, and we just got it, it's going back in business for the new school year. So we're really, really excited about that. and. Um, I'm just gonna, I know we're gonna talk about it later, but we're having a volunteer open house coming up on August 13th um, in a couple of weeks. So if y'all are interested in coming out and checking out the Mobile River, it will be there. And we're gonna give tours of the Red Bud program. So um, Emily, if you wanna put your contact information, you can contact Emily um, to schedule a, or more information on that open house so you can come see it. We're really excited. Also, let's see, Miss Laura is being honored as well. And I know she has been your, I call y'all Team Bennett. It's kind of my ongoing thing for you guys because y'all really are, y'all are a great team and you work really well together. And she looks like she was um, an amazing um, team captain for the race. And can you tell us what Miss Laura does on the lake, on the river um, in her spare time? I know she loves the lake just as much. Yeah, I think uh, she, she might spend more time on the lake than I do. She loved the paddleboard. Um, she was she had uh, the second paddleboard in Austin, Texas. She she a friend of hers who's from California 
had, had bought this board and paddle board in California and had it shipped in and kind of long story short, we ordered one. And I remember, I mean, now it's like, you, you, it, it's no big deal, but I remember watching the two of them. I was standing over on the bridge. I just finished a run right to Boston High. And I'm looking at the river and I see Laura and Karen paddling down the river. And they're the only two people on paddle boards and they're literally there for about they're taking pictures of them doing it because nobody had ever seen it before. And so uh, I, I, I call her one of, one of Austin's original paddle boarders. But, but anyway, she loves to get out on the river just like I do, um, whether it's paddle boarding or uh, whether we're in our boat in like Austin and her parents live on like Travis. And, and uh, she's a big opponent of, of, uh, of the, uh, understanding the importance of, of the Colorado River. Yeah, I can't believe she had the second paddleboard. She started the, the paddleboarding craze here in Austin. You yeah. know, she, she actually taught me, she took me on my first paddleboard experience a while, a long time ago, and it was fun. I swear I was going to, um, to get back out there. So I need to give her a call and make her get me back out on the paddleboard. You should. She's always looking for someone to do that. Yeah, she always brings her little, y'all's little puppy too. She brings her little doggy. So yeah. it's a family affair. Well, let's see. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, I'm going to give it back to Emily. Um, oh, I did want to mention before, before I gave it back to Emily, on the River Hero Award, we just, last year, um, we renamed the River Hero Award after um, one of our really longtime board members, John Lay. He was on the board for about 20 years, and he did. He helped launch our Red Bud program and, and those initial um, you know, the brainstorming and for the uh, mobile river. So I know that you and John have developed a really great friendship. John Lay is an amazing man. Um, and we're so glad to, to give you that. I know that you helped him on the river um, see his fulfill a lifetime bucket list item. So um, yeah. Do you have anything to say about John? Yeah, Lay? Sure. You know, I might get a little emotional, but <clears throat> John was the uh, <clears throat> president when I joined the board and um he um just a jolly great guy I think his daughter Sally's on the call today on the, on the Facebook live today um he um was instrumental in recruiting me to the board and just loves this organization and uh, um he uh, developed uh, ALS and and when he was early in his uh after the diagnosis, he had always wanted to basically get on the Colorado River, Colorado River in front of some property that he owns. And so uh, we went out one Sunday, I think it was morning, with John and a bunch of his family members and, and got in some, some boats that the LCRA helped organize and actually uh, went down the river and, and uh, he got to kind of realize that dream and see his property you know, from the river. It's, if you have to see it, you can it's kind of up high so we could, you know, he could see the river from the property, but he can never see the property from the river. So. It, um, again, it was a special day, and, and um, no, I, uh, I'm very, very honored uh, to receive an award named after John. Thanks, Kendall. Yeah, we, um, we're so glad to give you this award, and you, you and Laura, just y'all are, y'all are great, and we're just so thankful for your years on the board and your support over the many, many many years and yeah we just can't wait to celebrate you in october and hope everybody can come join us okay we're excited yeah, It'll be great to see everybody back together in person uh, as well yeah i'm gonna put the um the website information for our event and y'all can contact me if y'all are interested in sponsorship or more information um yeah and i'll throw it back over to emily thanks kendall thank you Awesome, thank you, Carrie. Yeah, definitely uh, check out our cocktails on the Colorado River event coming up. We would love to see everybody there. Um, so just to kind of wrap up everything, um, make sure that if you are interested in the volunteer open house, email me, it's just emily at coloradoriver.org. I will be sure to uh, get you all the information that you need. Um, be sure to uh, go ahead and follow us on all of our social media accounts um, at Colorado River Alliance. We would love to see you there. Our Lake Travis cleanup is coming up, so feel free to also follow our Lake Travis cleanup page. We look forward to seeing everybody in person there. <clears throat> and thanks again so much, Kendall, for sharing your experience and talking to us about 
John Lay and just being super involved in fantastic part of our organization. We really appreciate it. No, you're welcome. No, it's my pleasure. Thanks for including me and having me on the, uh, on the uh, program today. Of course, of course. But all right. Thank you all so much. Thank you to the audience members as well for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you at our next River Reflections. All right. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Kendall. Uh -huh. Thank you.